Hello my friends and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be doing a little knit and chat while I answer a few questions that I got on Instagram. I asked these a few weeks ago and I got quite a few responses. I got a lot of stuff about working at a sewing pattern company. I also got a lot of questions about life in Montreal and making crafty friends as well as quite a few others. So I will put timestamps so you can kind of flip through the chapters as you please. And then while I answer those questions, I'm gonna be working on my cardigan. This is the cardigan from Lindsay Degan. I've been working on this the past little few knit and chats and it's coming along really nicely. I've never worked with hand dyed yarn in like a sweater quantity before. And so I've been doing um, helical knitting and I'm really enjoying it. I also really like these decreases, I don't know how well you can see it on here, but I'm really liking how the decreases are turning out and it's a very interesting construction. It's a bottom up cardigan. I've never really done that before. But anyways, I'm gonna be knitting on this while I answer your questions. So if you wanna grab something to knit on or something to work on, or if you just wanna hang out and listen, that's cool too. I'm gonna to be going through your questions and we're just gonna jump right into it. The first question is, what is the first piece of clothing that you made? So the first piece of clothing that I made was a bucket hat, I believe. And then I was also at the time selling vintage. And so I thought that I would make like vintage, I would make coats out of like vintage blankets. So I did a lot of that. That was kind of my focus for a little while was doing these like vintage blankets uh, or vintage coats out of blankets. And so those were kind of my first few projects for the first um, little while. I didn't use patterns for a long time. I was kind of afraid of them. And I just sort of went off of the like seat of my pants sort of thing. But I know the first like clothing item was probably like a really garbage looking coat. And then I also, one of my like, early garments was a hat. And then I believe the first garment that I made from a pattern was a sea yellow top from Closet Gore, which is, which is kind of a fun uh, full circle moment since I do work for them now. So yeah, those are the first few garments that I made. I always tell everyone that making your own clothes, uh, the first like few are always going to be a little wonky, but I will say that like after the wonky ones, everything was like really good. I really took a lot of like time with the construction. I was really careful. And so a lot of my earlier pieces are actually really well made in comparison to sometimes maybe I get a little lazy or I get a little impatient now and I, I cut some steps. So I am actually really proud of a lot of those early garments. They um, have a special place in my heart, I will say. Um, yeah, so those are the first few garments that I ever made. Let's get on to the next question. It's such a creative city. I've found it like really easy to make creative friends as well. Uh, a lot of artists, a lot of working artists, a lot of artist markets and pop-ups and like all of that stuff. So yeah, I um, I really like this city. We have plans to stick around because um, we both like it so much and it's just been great. We've made some like really amazing friends here uh, faster than, like I said, I would have ever anticipated. So yeah, we, um, we really like it. So yeah, I always appreciate when people ask about Montreal because I have a lot of really like positive things to say about it. And then when did you start sewing? I started sewing in 2020. Well, well yeah, 2020, but I didn't start really start making garments until later in 2020, like maybe in the fall. Um, so yeah, coming up on like three proper years, I would say. Okay, next question. Who do you get inspo from? Let me pull up my Instagram saves because I actually find that like I save a lot of things that are inspiring me. And so I'll put them up on the screen here. So Lauren Knight is one of my favorites. I tend to save like most of her outfits. She doesn't um, make her clothes, but she's just got such a like vivid, fun, bright style that I love. Um, so I love following her. She's got this like playful sort of art teacher vibe. Uh, she wears a lot of colors, a lot of prints, a lot of like different patterns and stuff. I just really enjoy following her. So she's definitely someone I get a ton of inspo from. Um, I also have just been really inspired by different forms of color work. Like I have been saving a lot of color work lately ever since I've done my color work vest. I've just been really inspired by different palettes and I have a lot of that saved right now. Uh, just different combinations of colors. 
I also really love Valerina girl. She is, again, she doesn't make her own clothes, but she's got this like really bright, playful, sort of like dopamine dressing style that I absolutely love. And I also save like her outfits a ton. Okay, the next question is, how did you end up at Closet Core? And this is one that I got a lot. I've got a lot of variations of like, how did you end up at Closet Core? How do you get a job at Closet Core? What's it like working at Closet Core? All that stuff. So I'll just combine them all into this sort of uh, next little chapter. But I've been working there for a year now and I do customer service in social media. So it's a small team, so everyone kind of does multiple things. So I do a lot of the content creation, if not like most of the content creation, and then I answer customer emails and DMs and support and all that stuff. Working in an environment where people love the same things I love, like we talk about sewing all the time, and that is just like such a, a fun, cool thing. Like I just get to work in a sewing pattern company and we talk about sewing our own clothes and everyone makes their own clothes and everyone um, is just really creative and I get really inspired by the community as well because I engage with the community so much that I find I'm just always like looking at customer makes and looking at things that people are sewing and I just find I get really inspired by everything that people are doing and yeah I, I love going into the office as well um, so it's been really great and in terms of like how I got that job <laughs> I don't know that this is helpful, but I mean it's uh, you have to work in Montreal So or you have to live in Montreal So I obviously I live in Montreal and about a year ago. I just saw a job posting for my role and um, It came up in my newsletter and I obviously like I follow them and their newsletter and their social media and stuff so I got the newsletter and I immediately applied like I think I was still in bed when I was like pulling together my resume and my cover letter and writing the email to them. I hadn't even really started the day yet. I was just, I saw it, I woke up and I was like, okay, it's time. <laughs> it's go time. I have to, uh, I have to apply for this. So I did. And then, yeah, I've been there for over a year and it's been really fun. I've found that like my sewing has really, like my sewing game has upped a lot. Not even necessarily practically speaking, but like just in terms of my knowledge about sewing and my like theoretical understanding of fitting uh, just because I see so many garments on a day-to-day -day basis I'm aware of a lot of different fitting techniques I'm aware of like our drafting process I get to see things like being made in real time I get to like help customers on their fitting questions I find that um, yeah I just am much more aware of like a lot of theory about sewing and um, it's really helped improve my own sewing game so that's really cool and yeah and I get to make a lot of different things for work as well I get to make a lot of our own patterns and um, you know it's connected to the fabric store side of things so I also get access to a lot of really great and beautiful fabric so that's pretty fun too if it's not too personal what is your educational and professional background so um, it's not too personal at all. I studied English literature in university and I did a minor in classical studies. So I did that at Queen's University in Kingston. That's my alma mater, so to speak. And um, after I graduated, I took a year where I was working and trying to figure out what was next. And then I ended up doing a, um, a, a sort of a college program, like um, an applied program in public relations. And then I worked in public relations for several years, I worked at a fashion PR agency, which was really fun. And I got to do fashion shows and work with influencers and work with, you know, big fashion brands, like really cool fashion brands. And that was really fun, but it was really um, stressful and kind of traumatizing, to be honest. It was just like a really tough field and I suffered extreme burnout, like really bad burnout. and. I ended up moving on to work at a charity and so I worked at a charity for two years and then I took some time off to travel. I went to India for like four months, came back, kind of struggled to find a job, ended up at another charity and then the pandemic happened. And um, after the pandemic, my career trajectory sort of changed where I was trying to find more marketing jobs. I couldn't really find any marketing jobs. Um, nothing was hiring in marketing because, well, 
there was nothing to market during the pandemic. A lot of companies were doing layoffs and marketing was one of the first company, was one of the first roles to sort of go in most companies. So I got laid off like a couple times during the pandemic. It was honestly really awful. Um, but it ended up with me moving to Montreal with my partner when he got a job here. And then I ended up getting a job at Closet Core, still doing some marketing and social media, but it's definitely a, def a, like a change from like the corporate sort of rat race. And I just find it's such a nice change of pace for me. And it's definitely um, made me feel just a lot better about my job and my work and my mental health. And yeah, I'm definitely feeling, I feel like a lot more relaxed in this workspace than I have in any of my other workplaces. So. Yes, that's kind of my little background for you there. What do you think about sewing as a hobby and working in the sewing space? Does it affect your will to sew? So I think that's a really cool question and I kind of touched a bit on the thought earlier, but I would say it doesn't affect my will to sew. If anything, I feel really inspired all the time. Like the thing that affects my will to sew is just going to work and being tired at the end of the day or you know, not feeling like I have enough energy to sew after going into the office. But on work from home days, I, I do like to do a little bit of sewing or knitting in the evenings. But I would say because I'm not sewing for my job, I'm like in the sewing space, but I'm not physically sewing. It doesn't really impact my desire to sew. If anything, like I said, it kind of makes me want to sew more because I have access to our new patterns and I have access to a lot of the community and I see what people are making and I feel super inspired. So if anything, maybe I get some uh, decision fatigue because I don't always... <laughs> I always find it like a little challenging to decide what to make next, but yeah, I don't really struggle with feeling like, um, I don't really struggle with the, this idea of like being too tired to sew or burned out from my, my sewing job because I'm not sewing at work. So yeah, I would say that um, they are not related in that way. What are your current projects? So I've been working on this. This has been a um, sort of longer term project. I've also got a pair of needle. I've also got a pair of socks on my needles that I've abandoned. Like second sock syndrome is so real. I think I'm gonna have to try to do two at a time next because <laughs> I just am really not good at, um, I'm just really not good at doing this whole thing um, where I, I knit one and then knit the other. I do get really bored, even though I'm like, over halfway done the other sock. I just need to like get on it. So I've got this. I also have a video that's maybe gonna come out next week about some things that I'm making, so I won't spoil it. But uh, I've got a dress cut out. I'm looking at the stuff on my floor because I'm in my sewing room. And then I'm working on a little quilted vest. So those are my projects. I would really like to get going on a, a coat, like a winter coat. I don't know if that will happen this year, but I'm kind of hoping I can do like a lined wool coat. Um, maybe I'll finish it just in time for the winter to end, who knows, but yeah, that's kind of uh, a little bit of what's, of what's on the roster right now. Any advice on how artsy, craftsy introverts can make creative friends? I'm struggling. I feel you. I really feel you. It can be really challenging to make friends, um, especially as you get older and if you are introverted. And I'm, a, I'm an introverted person and it's something that I've had to work on because honestly, if it's up to me, sometimes I can just stay at home and not interact. So I try to make myself have at least like one friend date a week. But in terms of like how to actually make friends in creative spaces, I do think that as an introvert, you really have to put yourself out there. And that always feels really uncomfortable. But I think it's really important to try if it's something that's important to you. So when I first moved to Montreal, uh, my partner had a friend here and then he also had friends, like he had coworkers. So when we moved here, he had a bit more of a network than I did just off the bat. And I only had him. And I knew that that wasn't gonna work for me if we were gonna stay here long term. So I put a lot of effort into joining spaces that were aligned with my interests. So I started working a little bit at a knitting store and I made really good friends there. And then I also started working at a yoga studio and I was able to make friends through the yoga studio. And I would always sort of knit while I was behind the desk at the yoga studio. And so I got to talk to people and um, because they saw me knitting and that was kind of a way for me to start to meet crafty people. It was just like being in spaces, knitting, uh, going to creative events, like I would go to uh, little markets and stuff and I would meet people through that. And then a big thing that has sort of 
contributed to making crafty friends in person has been um, the internet where I connect with so many amazing people online and I you know definitely put myself out there sometimes and try to connect with people in the city uh, people who I know live in Montreal who like want to maybe want to meet up or want to be friends or even just finding that creative community online can sometimes be satisfying enough for an introvert where you have those people to talk to in Facebook groups or on Instagram or whatever it is. And sometimes that is enough for me as well. I've had a few people recommend going to like stitch and bitch nights or like yarn knit nights or quilting guilds, um, crafty events, meetup.com apparently is a really good one that people like for finding events with, you know, that are related to their interests. So I would recommend looking into all those and I hope that you can find your community because it has been really um, a blessing for me and I, I kind of wish, I wish the same thing for everyone. But you do have to put yourself out there as an introvert. Um, I know it's not easy, but you do have to do it. Okay, um, oh, oh, I got a little funny stitch there. How is settling into Montreal going? Montreal is really great. I really love living in Montreal. I've sort of found my pace here. I've got a job, I've got a lot of friends. I'm taking French classes, or I'm gonna start to take French classes soon. Hopefully I've like registered, so I just have to get into that. And um, I just really love this city. I've found it so much easier than living in Toronto, to be honest. I just find the pace of Montreal really nice. It's a bit slower, a bit more relaxed. It's a very beautiful city. I find it quite pretty. I love our apartment. We moved into our, our new place in April and we really like it. And so overall, like moving to Montreal and settling in and finding friends and getting into the right sort of pace here has been a lot easier than I ever really expected it to be. Okay, next one, a cool fabric shop in Montreal. So I haven't been to a ton, but I really like um, in the plateau, it's called Club Tissue. That's a cool one. They have a lot of like vintage notions as well as a lot of vintage patterns. Um, and they've got patterns, like uh, so many vintage patterns and they, uh, they charge, I believe, the price that's on the envelope from like when the pattern was originally, when the pattern originally came out. So they can be quite affordable, some of them. So that's one. I recently went to um, Tissue Saint Hubert, I believe. Um, that was a really fun experience. So I recommend going there. But I don't know a lot of um, a lot of fabric stores in Montreal actually because I work, um, you know, in, I work for Closet Core and we've got the fabric store attached and. Um, yeah, I don't do a ton of fabric shopping in Montreal because of that. So I would start with those two. I really like them both. Also, J&L Sewing is a great one. Um, I recommend that. And I've heard a lot of things about Globatex, which is apparently like a very, very massive sort of fabric warehouse, which I really want to go to, but I haven't been yet. Okay, next. Opinions on DPNs. Hate them. Easy. <laughs> I hate DPNs. I just can't do it. They're not my they're not my style. What made you want to start knitting? So I started knitting in university when a really good friend of mine had a major surgery that meant that she couldn't go out. Uh, she couldn't leave the house. She was bedridden, and so she was bored to tears with like books and movies. And so I got us knitting supplies, and we watched YouTube videos, and we learned how to knit, and that kind of became our activity. But we only really made like scarves and eventually hats. We didn't really venture off into other things. And then eventually I started to join, you know, the online sewing community. And I loved seeing what people were making and it kind of exposed me to what people were knitting. And I thought like, oh my God, I could be making these things that like other people are making, that's crazy. I started to get really inspired. And so I decided to try my hand at learning how to knit more complicated things. So I started to make sweaters. My first sweater was the Claude sweater, as you might know, because I talk about it a lot. And uh, yeah, it was kind of just like, it spiraled from there. But I would say being able to like make your own knitwear is so special. And a hand knit garment just has its own kind of love in it. And I will say that even though my grandmother didn't teach me how to knit, she knits a ton of baby sweaters. She knits a lot of scarves and hats and I always love receiving her scarves and her hats 
and it has, you know, made me want to be able to replicate that for myself as well. So that's also part of it is I'm really inspired by the stuff that she's made like my whole life. And um, yeah, that's kind of, uh, I think a little bit of the backstory there. What kind of knitting needles do you prefer? I use wooden circulars. These are the Leakin needles. They're my favorite. Um, that's kind of it. <laughs> I'll link them in the description box if you're curious about the set that I use. But yeah, they're just Leco wooden interchangeable needles. They're my go-to. Um, how long did it take you to become a confident knitter? So it took, it took me, I would say after my first sweater, I started to feel more confident. And after that, I just felt like I could kind of take on more. I like... The cloth sweater is a really great beginner friendly knitting pattern. And from there, I just started to try my scales out a little bit more. I was like, okay, I can knit a sweater flat. How about knitting a sweater in the round um, and so on. And eventually I just felt, started to like really understand knitting terminology better. And I like, you know, looked up anything on YouTube that I didn't know. But I would say like, because I was knitting for so long in university, even though I was knitting scarves only, I did have like the technique down, but um, sweaters are what leveled up my knitting. So after my first sweater, because sweaters are such long projects that you're and you're knitting a lot of like similar techniques over and over again, I think that once you knit a sweater, it's so much easier to level up. And so it was like after a year of like knitting sweaters, I started to notice my skill level just increased dramatically and my I was knitting faster and I was understanding techniques more and all that. So not really a straightforward answer, but hopefully that helps. How is crochet going? I kind of paused on crochet, but there's this really cute little like um scarf that I've been wanting to make that's like a wiener dog scarf. So maybe that will like get me back into crochet. But honestly, I just don't love it as much as knitting. I don't get like the satisfaction that I do from knitting. What is your YouTube dream? Would you do YouTube full time? So I had to think about this. You know, I've, I've thought about this a lot over the years. I think I would potentially do YouTube full time as long as like I could supplement it with something else, like maybe some sort of like additional online business. Um, I'm really happy with what I'm doing right now, so I don't feel in a rush to change things up. And I also, like I said, have started to sort of think about my YouTube in a bit of a different way, trying to like de-stress my YouTube for myself a bit. So I'm not putting any pressure to try to make it full time, but um, I think if I could make it full time, along with like another online side business or maybe um, something here in Montreal, I would consider it, but it's not exactly on my radar at the moment. I do have plans to like continue to grow this channel, but I'm trying to approach YouTube with a little more grace for myself and less stress. And so trying to think about monetizing, I mean, it is monetized, but trying to think about how to like massively grow it is just not um, the right headspace for me at the moment but yeah I think that there is potential on YouTube and I love making YouTube videos I really love this space a lot and um I just really enjoy it so I want to keep doing it but yeah it's not always um the most mental health friendly again I've talked about it in like a knit and chat um where I talked about YouTube and my feelings about YouTube and influencer stuff and all that if you want to check it out because I get quite into detail with that one so the next question is what platform is your favorite for content? I really like YouTube a lot. I like making longer form videos. I also find it like really easy to connect with people on YouTube. So many more people comment on YouTube than they do like on Instagram, for example. So I would say that YouTube is like one of my favorites, but I also do have like a soft spot um, for TikTok as well because TikTok is just so fun and it's so easy to create content for TikTok. I just like the short form, like sort of spur of the moment ideas that I come up with on TikTok. And I feel like I can be like the most authentic version of myself on TikTok. I don't know why that is. I'm actually working on bringing who I am on TikTok to YouTube. So if you wanna follow me on TikTok, it's the same, Making Cassie. Same with Instagram, Making Cassie, and then yeah, obviously YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I really like all three platforms. I'm finding my stride again on Instagram. We recently hit 15K over there, which is like a really fun milestone. It feels like it kind of stagnated forever. And then I had a one little reel go a bit viral. And so that's been really fun to, to have a little bit of a flood of new people there, not even for the followers, just more 
um, more comments and more community building. And I've uh, I mentioned in my other like knit and chat where I talked about social media and stuff how I was trying to change like my mindset on social media, and I've found that I've really been able to do that successfully. So yeah, I would say YouTube is one of my faves, but TikTok has a close sort of. Um, second to it and then instagram is fine i'll always be on instagram as, probably as long as the platform is around but it is definitely like not oh i'm all tangled here definitely not like as much my favorite all right let's go on to the next okay what is the hardest part of sharing online that kind of ties into that question nicely so the hardest part of sharing yourself online is vulnerability i think anytime you bring yourself bring your most vulnerable self to the table or you bring your truest self to the table there is a scariness there and the hardest part is like showing up and not being received or feeling like you're not being received another part that has been hard for me is showing up in a way that feels like really authentic um, I feel like I'm again finally really grasping what that means and how to do that but it's taken a little bit to just get comfy in it and um, I am feeling you know a lot better about like I said my presence online but it is hard to have you know to sh share who you are and op leave yourself open for criticism my comments are usually like pretty positive but every once in a while yeah you kind of get something that you aren't expecting or aren't ready for and um, it really like reveals your insecurities to you or you know when you put so much time into a video and it flops or you put so much time into a piece of content and it doesn't work out it it's hard to not take it personally but one thing I've really learned through my own like online behaviors is it's just not personal I don't like not click on a video because of any personal reasons um, it's just maybe not interesting to me or it's not I don't have the time to watch it or whatever so I've been really working on creating healthy boundaries for myself with like how I engage with content online and that has been working for me quite well so yes I would say it's really challenging but really rewarding you just have to figure out how to do it in a way that makes sense for you and um, also honors your own like mental space so all right so that's it thank you so much for watching if you want to watch that knit and chat where i talk about maybe quitting youtube my thoughts about being an influencer all that stuff you can watch that one right here uh, i think that's like a nice little segue from this video otherwise i have a few other sort of longer form chatty videos if you want to watch those and i will see you next time bye